Yes, hello. It's Jason Louve. This is the Ultra Culture Podcast. And yes, I know this sounds bad. It sounds bad because I'm recording this on my phone. And if you hear traffic noise in the background, it's because I'm standing on the uh, 17th floor of an office building looking out over Los Angeles at night. And it looks exactly like the opening of Blade Runner, which is pretty cool. Uh, but I'm doing that because all of my podcast gear is currently boxed up. I had a beautiful house picked out that turned out to be on a nuclear spill uh, area. If you're bored, look up Santa Susana Field Laboratory and you'll find out uh, everything you need to know about it. Um, it turns out the biggest nuclear spill in American history was in Los Angeles in 19, the 1950s. And they covered it up for two years. Or excuse me, 20 years they covered it up for. No one knew about it. Uh, all of the groundwater was irradiated and it's still irradiated. It's never been cleaned up. They had an exposed nuclear core with no shielding on it that uh, had a partial meltdown and irradiated the entire San Fernando Valley. And nobody even knew about it. Nobody was, no one was allowed to know about it for decades. And it's still poisoning the groundwater on the left side of the valley, and it's still causing cancer. Apparently, it was 359 times worse than Chernobyl, and no one's ever heard of it. That's, uh, that's America for you. So uh, what can I say? It's also California, Los Angeles for you. Uh, an unbelievable turn of events. So long story short, uh, I did not move into that house. I have everything in boxes, and I'm looking for the next place to go. And it's just been that kind of year. It's probably been that kind of year for you, too. But congratulations on surviving. At least we've made it this far. We're through the election, and we're starting to see, I would say, we're starting to see glimpses of what the future is going to turn into. I'm up here looking out across... Los Angeles, and I'm starting to think today not just about what the hell is going on in 2020 or who's going to win the election or, or any of that stuff, but it kind of finally hit me today that we're at the beginning of a whole new decade. Uh, we've put the, the 2010s, the kind of the decade of social media behind us, and now we're entering the 2020s, which I think will be the decade of virtual reality, augmented reality artificial intelligence, uh, the worsening effects of climate change, and the general breakdown of all models, all prior models of civilization. Not in a zombie apocalypse way, but just in a head-spinning way of things changing faster in this decade, I think, probably than they changed even in the last 20, 30 years even in the last 10 years, it's going to be crazy, particularly when AI really kicks in. I think the wealth stratification is going to be more extreme even than now, uh, in where, where you have basically one guy, Jeff Bezos, who's won the whole pie. Uh, I think it's going to be even more extreme. We're going to start seeing things like private space travel for very wealthy people kicking in as they try to get out of this mess. So yeah, I've been up here in this office thinking about how to best help, how to, um, not, not help, help is the wrong word, but it's really like, what is the mission of magic.me going forward? What are people really going to need? What are they going to really truly need to empower them, to connect them with their sense of true purpose in life, to reorient, uh, in a really powerful way to this new world, which is going to be full of tremendous opportunities, even as it is also full of chaos and, and tumult, to say the least. But it's exciting. Hey, we get to live in the, uh, the cyberpunk future we all grew up <laughs> re reading uh, books and role-playing games and watching movies about. So there you go. Um, but yeah, I've been doing a lot of thinking about that. I'm also worried, to be honest. I'm, I'm really concerned about people getting through this period. Uh, it is just an unbelievably cruel and brutal thing to do to shut down the country to the point that people are losing their livelihoods. And yes, uh, I understand coronavirus. I am not a coronavirus uh, denier or anything like that. But it's hard to see people have literally everything taken away from them uh, over one thing, one mortality factor among many, 
I mean, how many people in this country die of heart disease from their diet or in the world, rather? I shouldn't even be talking about this country. This is a global issue. How many people die of traffic accidents? How many die, people die of uh, cancer, et cetera? <clears throat> And again, I'm not downplaying the seriousness of COVID. I'm not a COVID denialist or anything like this, but it's hard not to be angry seeing people have everything they've built their entire life taken from them overnight and not having any say in it. Let me put it that way. So um, this podcast is a gift it's a uh, it's actually a bunch of stuff edited together from the alchemy of chaos which is my most recent mega course you can see it at magic.me but i've decided to take what i think is the most pertinent information on financial security put it into one podcast and give it out for free because i think people need it and uh, of course if you want the full course it's there for you but i wanted to pull out some of the most useful stuff just and just give it to people because it's It'd be a little uh, gauche of me, let's say, to have, you know, some really useful financial information and, 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 and totally paywall it and say like, oh, well, you know, only if you confront the money for it. So obviously the course is huge. There's like, you know, 50, 60 times the amount of content in this podcast or well, no, much, much more. I mean, in the paid course, but I wanted to take this and give it out. So we're going to cover a lot in this podcast I'm going to be talking about the trajectory of technology, how to surf that wave for your own financial benefit, um, for your own financial stability. Because let's be honest, I mean, we can, you know, and I've said this before in podcasts and courses, certainly, we can talk about spirituality uh, till the cows come home, but if you can't pay the bills, uh, it's going to be the furthest thing from your mind. And anyone who tells you that, that, you know, you can't use magical techniques for money, uh, hasn't needed to. Let me put it that way. All right. (laughs) So let's get you, um, or I, I, well, let me just put it this way. I would hope that this information, uh, uh, can help contribute to some people's, uh, well being. So we're going to talk about how to surf the wave of technology to get ahead, to think ahead, uh, to, you know, maybe find some very lucrative opportunities. Uh, for yourself, uh, for your family, even if right now is chaotic, uh, and we're and how to think out on the edge, how to think five, ten years in advance, so that you can capture opportunities that are there right now, um, if you can jump on them. Uh, we're going to talk about mindset and how to think about wealth generation, how to think about business, how to think about earning money, how to think about wealth generation, and of course, because I'm me, I approach this as a a spiritual and magical endeavor and a challenge. And uh, I'm going to be talking, you know, giving out some, a few useful free resources and places to start on thinking about how to build real wealth, right? So this is, I'm not going to be talking about any kind of like, you know, get rich quick scheme or things like that. I'm, I'm talking about real, you know, you know, real ideas on how to build, um, you know, effective wealth generating tools for yourself, pr- primarily businesses and things like that. So, uh, because I've seen this stuff free people and give them a sense of liberation, security, happiness, that is what people need. And hopefully that's what I'm here for, which is to help empower people. Okay. So just a few notes on context on this material. So this is obviously from alchemy of chaos. So it's kind of cut together and there's some stuff in it that, uh, um, maybe a little confusing and that's what, uh, so on that point, um, the course itself is structured in terms of chakras, meaning, uh, you know, I go through the course and we have, we have a different, uh, we have material for each chakra, by the way, if you took the adept initiative by any chance, uh, that covers the elements alchemy of chaos covers the seven planets and seven chakras attendant upon them and is therefore the follow-on course from ADEPT. They work together perfectly. I'm probably going to reference at certain points in this prep work that students in the course did in prior units, so don't get confused or feel that you're missing out. If you hear that stuff, obviously, you can find out all about that stuff in the full course, but uh, that's why that's there. Uh, And there's also probably points where I reference uh, a resources tab, the workbook for the course, homework assignments, etc. So obviously, just like the prep work, that's stuff in the full course. 
So, you know, there may be points where I reference that stuff. So don't get confused if you hear that. It's just because I took it out of the big course. So it's my hope with this podcast that this gets your wheels turning in some new ways or, or, or re you know, starts up the engine again if, you have, if you've thought about the stuff a lot before but haven't been thinking about it recently because you've been too busy, too caught up in reacting to all the chaos uh, of this year and, and trying to keep your head above water just like me and just like everyone else. And I hope it's of, of use. Okay, so that's it for me. Uh, more podcasts soon. Hopefully I'll be more situated shortly and can use professional recording gear. But even if I can't, I'm just going to do stuff on the phone. So uh, there we have it. All right. So uh, as usual, the you can find out more at magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. And there's lots more to come. All right. Where I'm going to take this unit, where I really want to open some doors for you, is in a completely radically new way of thinking about business, economics, money, and the post-COVID world and the world that we're going into. Because many people are, of course, bemoaning the collapse of the economy, and it is tragic, right? Now, again, I'm recording this in 2020, but I don't think that these things are going to go away anytime soon. We are looking at probably permanent sea changes in the global economy and certainly the way that we need to start thinking about business, economics, and work. And so my goal for you is to get you thinking way out ahead, right? To get you thinking way out on the edge of the wave, because if you're surfing the wave, you won't get crushed by it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean any of this is going to be easy because uh, all of this is, of course, going to involve work, right? Because we're talking about work. Um, none of this is easy, but uh, if we don't adapt, then, you know, we are gonna, we're going to lose out uh, and suffer, unfortunately. So reality is as it is. And our job as forward thinkers, as magical thinkers, is to adapt, evolve, and come up with clever ways to prosper and thrive. So we're going to talk a lot about different ways to generate wealth in this chakra. We're going to talk about uh, primarily creating new businesses, which really is the best way to do it. We're also going to talk about investments, uh, investment opportunities, such as, for instance, investing in the market, in cryptocurrency, new economic opportunities, as well as real estate and also generating wealth through intellectual property. Now, if you've taken the ADAPT initiative or you're working on taking it, you're planning on taking it, uh, I talk a lot about these categories in this in that course. In fact, that course, in addition to its sister course, The Fortuna Working, is primarily oriented towards wealth generation. So it really goes well with the material in this course. Now, the way that this course is different is that we're going to talk about specifically how to change approach to this new economic reality, right? And I think that there are some very fundamental shifts that need to happen in terms of wealth creation and frankly, some very exciting ones for those who are willing to take uh, a chance. I won't even say a risk, more of a calculated risk, right? Uh, looking for opportunity. Okay, so the primary thing we need need to do in this unit before we start talking about specifics is talk about your mindset. So let me just say this. The biggest economic mistake you can make, uh, and in fact, perhaps one of the biggest mistakes you can make in your life, is waiting for somebody else. That means waiting for somebody else to give you... Uh, you know, some sense of economic security or specifically waiting for somebody else to say yes. Now, you've probably been raised and probably experienced throughout most of your life, if you're like most people, um, a certain mindset, a certain attitude towards wealth that is either, there's probably some combination of wealth, it must be given, inherited, or given to you by, for instance, government support, uh, or should be, right, that it's not fair if it's not given to you, or um, if you're in the middle class, like probably most people who are watching this, this class, uh, then you've been raised to think of money as something that you must work for that somebody else must give you. And that means 
the mindset of I need to go to school to get a good education. And from that, I need to go get a good job and work my way up and make sure I please other people. And then they will give me the tickets that I need to do all the things that I want to do, except I won't have any time left because I'll just be working for someone else. So this is an old idea. And I want to be very clear about this. We were all raised to believe that that is the safe path, right? It's not the safe path. It hasn't been the safe path for probably at least 10 to even 20 years. The idea that you go, and I, you know, I'm probably repeating things you already know, but the idea that you can go somewhere and just, if you jump through all the hoops and you do everything right, that you'll have a steady uh, and stable career path. It just hasn't been, it just hasn't worked for quite a while. And so this is actually quite risky behavior. Here is what I suggest in general as a general principle, and then I will modify it for 2020. Business, which here, so first let me define what is business, right? Business is finding other people's needs and fulfilling them, finding a need that is currently unfulfilled, and then fulfilling it in a way that makes them so happy that they are willing to trade you money for that service and continue to do so, right? So business is, I think, the primary way in the 21st century in which people manifest their will in the world in a real and sustainable way, right? Business itself is, in a sense, a magical system, and it's a damn good one, right? So the exciting thing about this, one of the many exciting things, is that since the probably the mid to late 2000s, with the advent of social media, with uh, you know cheap or in many cases free hosting platforms for the web or email, building a mailing list, YouTube, Instagram, and then of course Facebook and Twitter. All of these platforms to self-market or to get your message, your will, or your product out to the masses, essentially the whole idea of a big company being the focus of work is archaic, right? It really is. Now, one person that I'm not a huge of fan not a huge fan of the effect on the world of is is Karl Marx. However, Karl Marx had some extremely important ideas that I've learned a lot from, right? Now, I I'm about as far from a Marxist as you can get these days, but Marx had a very very clear analysis of uh the world. And by the way, the reason that I don't like Marxism is that it is it is desacralized even more so than capitalism. Marxism sees the world as pure economics. You can imagine to a guy like me who's quite interested in the sacred dimension of life, for me to look at that and then to look at, for instance, how uh, religious people uh, were, have been persecuted under communism, the Tibetans, for instance, you can imagine I wouldn't be a fan of that, but uh, that's enough on politics. Uh, Marx, however, had some, a very clear economic analysis of capitalism, even if all that he was doing was forming kind of the flip side of capitalism. In that essentially, what he says, capital, right? Capital is where power rests. Capital is not money, right? And people often use it like that. Capital is not money. Capital is the means of production. It means the, it means, it meant at his time in the 19th century, owning a factory. And his point that he was making is that the the classes that own the factories are able to set the rules. They're able to um, uh, essentially control labor. They're able to set prices, and they're able to you know basically call all the shots, and often in an abusive way. Now he's talking about you can imagine nineteenth century industrial England. It's not like he didn't have a point, right? But and therefore, in his estimation, capitalism means that there is a, a wealthy class that owns the means of production and is therefore able to set the rules for everyone else. And that therefore the working classes, those are the workers who ran the factories should organize to use their collective bargaining power, their collective labor power to demand more rights. And then ultimately to overthrow the structure of society itself. Okay. That's a 19th century idea, right? It's no longer particularly relevant. It is in some ways, but Marx's idea of seize the means of production, that's a very powerful idea, right? Now, he wanted the workers to collectivize, to seize the factories, and therefore to share the fruits of their labors. In the 21st century, a lot has changed. So obviously, factories 
It's not that we don't work in factories anymore. It's just that we have outsourced uh, factory work to the developing world and are completely oblivious to the abuses that happen there. That's a whole other tangent we could go on. It's, it's, it's uh, quite shocking. But in the, in the first world, people largely do information labor now. They develop information capital uh, or they work in, in some way in the information economy. In the information economy, everyone has the means of production. If you have it, the, if you're watching this on a computer, you have everything and you have to be, even if you're uh, watching this on a phone, you have everything you need to create anything that you can possibly imagine in the business sphere, right? You have, if you have a phone or you have a computer, then you have everything you need to build a website. You have everything you need to, well, even prior to building a website, you have access to all of the information in all of human history. Just get on Wikipedia, get on all these free online courses like Harvard or, you know, you have basically infinite inf information. And by the way, people in the developing world right now are leveraging and using this at breakneck speed. If you look at a place like Ghana, which is currently uh, uh, hyper industrializing and blasting forward into the information economy at, at Singapore level speeds, or you look at a place like the Philippines, Manila in the Philippines, or you look at many of these places, um, the developing world is leveraging information technology to overtake first world workers in a lot of ways. And that's a, that's a very exciting development, but it's also something that really does mean that first world laborers really need to learn how to compete, right? Because their, their labor will simply not be uh, very valuable. And so Marx's original point that labor should collectivize, yes, right? But however, <laughs> the, the value of labor is not very valuable anymore, right? Because we don't work in factories and, you know, the way of the world is simply that labor can be outsourced to the developing world for very cheap. And in even more so than that, we're entering a world now where nearly all jobs that are done by unskilled or skilled workers will be done by artificial intelligence. They'll be done by, uh, at the very least, algorithms and software. And as this decade advances, and certainly by mid-century, we will see things like machine learning and artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles and things like this essentially overtake almost everything we currently think of as work. And that's just how things are going. Yes, it is very tragic when an economy collapses, but the truth is that economies are have a life cycle, right? And the economy uh, that we're currently in or that is currently dwindling is based on ideas, networks, and, and modes of operation that are already historically obsolete, right? So our goal should be to adapt to what's coming 20 years from now, 30 years from now, not uh, lamenting that things are falling apart, that things are not, uh, that, that things are, because they're not going to come back. I mean, and this is just the evolutionary red and tooth and claw way of the world. Am I excusing the abuses of big corporations? Absolutely not. Right. But we can sit here all day long and talk about how things should be and how things should be fair and how things could be in a better utopian world that will never come. Or we could adapt to reality as it is and make our lives at the very least flourishing and prosperous. OK, and that's what we're going to talk about. So, like I said, the most dangerous thing we can possibly do is wait for somebody else to say yes right? Yes to your business idea. Yes to hiring you. Yes to bringing you money, anything like this. Again, you have everything you need to come up with an idea that brings you more money than perhaps you ever thought possible. So let's break down the basics of this, right? Like I said, business is the ability to identify and fulfill needs in a way that returns value to you of such a degree that it makes continuing the business profitable and self-sustaining, right? So look around you in the world. Look online, look in your neighborhood, look at your friends, look at what you know uh, the world is shaping up to be like. Do you see any human needs? Do you see any human desires, any unfulfilled uh, human potential? Well, you probably don't see anything but, right? And that's the tragedy of times of economic crisis, but it's also the opportunity, 
right? Let me give you an example. In the last economic crisis, which was, you know, 2008 to 2010, some of the businesses that you rely on now uh, were all born, right? So for example, Facebook really took off during that time, but even more so than that, uh, the, the gig economy, the sharing economy, things like Uber, Airbnb, Lyft, these businesses were all born out of ideas from people on laptops, whether it was one individual or a group, which is even better when you get a group of people together to develop an idea, right? Then they became, you know, uh, Uber, for instance, you know, started out with, as two guys and uh, it overtook the entire transportation industry, right? To the point where it completely put everyone in cabs out of work, right? Is that rough? Yes. Is Netflix taking Blockbuster out rough? Yes. But here's the thing. Like, for instance, these are all cycles. So businesses are, are, are living and breathing things. They have a, a story arc, if you will, or a life cycle, right? So it's just the way that things work. And the reason that it works like that is because history itself changes and people's needs change. So it comes down to this. You can lament the world that was, or you can get to work building the new one. Not waiting for the new one, not waiting for somebody to arrive with a stimulus check or a job or in some way sorting out your problems because it's not going to work like that. Build. Be one of the brave people who is, who's willing to build the future for all of us because people, we all have, we all need to prosper, to thrive. And we need you at your best. We need your highest talents. The ideas that maybe you've been too uh, intimidated to bring out into the world, into businesses or, or to develop. We need that. We really do, right? And be that person. Be the brave soul, right? And yes, you will benefit. But it's not just about money. Let me make this very clear. Very, very clear. You probably at some point have been exposed to or have even imbibed the lie that business is about taking, right? The idea that it is about exploiting people, that it is about, that it is about taking because, because there's an exchange of value, that it's therefore taking wealth from other people uh, and or that it's built on a, a structure of exploitation. Uh, this is simply false thinking. Now, that's not to say that some businesses don't have exploitation in them, but to then make the leap that all of essentially human economic activity is somehow evil is just unintelligent, right? The truth is that business is not about taking. If business was just about taking, nobody would be in business, right? Because nobody would want to participate in that. Business is about making something. It's about creating value. It's about bringing something into the world that didn't exist until you put it there, right? In such a way that people fall in love with your, with, with your product, right? In such a way that people say, this truly fulfills, you know, something that I probably couldn't even articulate to myself fully that I needed or that I could articulate but wasn't being met, right? That's what business is. It is fulfilling human need and human need is infinite and therefore potentials for profitable, bu profitable businesses are also infinite and always will be no matter what the economy is doing as if that's some type of God, right? The economy is simply reflecting changes. And just like everything else we've talked about in this unit, it is simply a process of change. It goes up and down and up and down, right? So react to reality as it is on the ground and find human needs. So in the case of the 2020 coronavirus crisis, or whatever may happen in that regard in the future in terms of big macro trends, macroeconomics or global events, do these things create human needs? Do they create needs, for instance, for totally new ways of doing business? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Perhaps you're having a more personal crisis like the loss of a job. Does that create opportunity? Does that create need? Certainly for you. Perhaps does it create the fire you need in order to create something new? Absolutely, right? Many of the greatest businesses in history uh, have been formed out of a layoff, right? Or a job loss. And finally, 
maybe in the case of a even more personal crisis, something uh, close to home, something that is affecting you uh, in your life, potentially with loved ones, with relatives, with uh, your own health, things like this, could even in that there be the seed of a need that can be fulfilled? Because if you're having a crisis, many millions of other people are likely having it too and have had it throughout history and will have the same or a close crisis. Uh, and if you can solve that, if you can fulfill your own need and then turn that into a business to solve that need at scale, you will be a wealthy person and also you will have brought happiness, security, and comfort to potentially millions of people. I truly believe that business is the engine of spiritual progress, right? Or it certainly can be, right? I haven't seen anything else that does quite as good of a job. And uh, because at the end of the day, you can talk all you want about spiritual dogma and religious beliefs and all of this, all of this is critical, right? It is a deep, important, these are deeply important systems for nurturing and nourishing the human soul. And yes, at the truest level, spirituality is completely outside of the economic realm and must be right at the highest level. However, I also believe that a big part of spirituality is compassion for other people, right? It's about looking after and reducing suffering of other people, right? And that's very clear. It's clear in Buddhism. It's clear in Christianity. that spiritual work involves easing the suffering of other people. Business is what is capable of doing that, right? It is what is capable of doing that at scale and renewably instead of burning out the people trying to do that because it generates enough resources to advance the mission, right? And it is a spiritual mission or it certainly should be. What are your passions? What are your talents? What do you truly care about? And potentially even what are the crises that you're facing right now that you must solve and that if you can solve, that perhaps you could then begin working on solving at scale for other people once you have the answer. In that, you will begin to find the seeds of the new world, right? Because ultimately what you need to ask yourself is not just what am I good at or what am I passionate about or what can I do? It's where do my talents and my passions and my drives, where does that overlap with other people's needs? right? In that overlap, right, of what you truly care about and what other people truly need, you will find the germs of the future and you will find the seed of something that can make you very wealthy and even more important than that, content, right? Because you have done something good for the world. Could be rocky right now, but remember, it's in the most, it's in the most seemingly dark moments, the most seemingly hopeless moments, that if you find and plant a seed, by the time everything comes back, by the time the economy is thriving, by the time that you're back in the saddle, uh, you'll be light years ahead. You'll have a tree that has grown out of that. These things start small. They start with an idea and often they start with a problem. If you study the great businesses of history, many of them have started with somebody trying to solve a personal problem. So Let's talk about a few more overarching concepts that are really critical, and then we're, we're going to get into production. We're going to make we're going to get straight into ways to begin producing wealth, which of course is your ultimate security and your ultimate way to build your future and the future for those that you care about. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the four financial food groups. If you've taken the Adept Initiative, we talk a lot about these in, in that course, as well as in the Fortuna Working. But just as a recap or to present this information to you for the first time, if you haven't yet taken those classes, uh, here's, here's what they are. So you have four quadrants of economic production. One is business. We've talked a little bit about that in the last unit. We're going to talk a lot more about it in this unit, but it's creating a business. Right? And by the way, do you need to have a genius business idea? Do you need to even come up with your own business idea? No, right? You can franchise. You can become a franchisee of an already successful business, one that perhaps is still successful or even more successful than it was prior in the post-2020 world, right? That you can easily do that. You don't need to create something new. You can just, if you're a more, um, you know, engineering type, operational type person, 
uh, instead of coming up with something new, just pick something that already works. Why reinvent the wheel? Now, personally, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a, a million ideas a minute kind of guy. So, you know, I'm kind of doomed to create businesses in a way, but uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Or you can do multiple businesses. That's fine too. So that would be our first economic quadrant. The next one would be investing, specifically in securities. That means stocks and bonds, and increasingly it means cryptocurrency. So essentially this means investing in other people's businesses for a return, or in bonds, or in cryptocurrency, or Forex, and things like this. Uh, we'll talk about that in its own unit. But that too is an excellent way to generate wealth. And we'll talk about some powerful strategies to do that. Uh, with, and you don't need to be, you know, and have an economics degree. You don't even know, need to know how to trade the market to make money from it. We'll talk about that too. Um, all right. The third one would be real estate. So real estate means investing in properties, ideally when they're on sale, like in the current world or after, if you have the capital to do that but often investing in them with other people's money, i.e. a bank's, that's what a mortgage is. So real estate, also an excellent bet, and people are always gonna need to place, uh, people will always need a place to live. So we'll talk about some powerful strategies there, even if you don't have the capital uh, or the, the, you know, the cash, as it were, to invest in actual properties, you don't need to. You can also buy something called an REIT, uh, which is a fund that invests in real estate companies so that you can get returns from the real estate market without having to have the hassle of actually buying, maintaining, and owning properties, right? So because that's also work, right? You can invest in real estate just great with REITs. Okay. Finally, our fourth quadrant is intellectual property, right? Now, what does this mean? Of course, intellectual property can mean royalties. So for instance, if you write a book, uh, make an album, make a game, make a movie, you're probably getting residuals from that, right? So that's intellectual property. Another very exciting form of intellectual property is inventions, right? And this goes straight back to what we were talking about prior in terms of solving other people's needs. Now, of course, businesses can be created if you have an idea for a product, but you can also simply patent something. And by the way, there are ways that if you have the idea for something, but you don't know how to create it or manufacture it, there's actually groups you can take it to who will create the thing for you and help you patent it, right? So you don't need to be an engineer to do this. You can just have a back of a napkin idea that becomes a new patent, and then you can get uh, royalties or licensing fees from that as well. Even if you don't yourself develop it into a business, you can license it to somebody that does and then be getting money from that forever right? Happens all the time. So these are our four basic quadrants. What I want you to begin to do is to look at those quadrants, and I've listed them in the workbook, and think about which ones most appeal to you, which ones are most accessible to you. So for instance, it's hard to invest in, in full property if you don't have the money to do it, although you can begin by buying REITs um, and, and so forth. You may be naturally inclined to be a creator, an inventor, or you may be naturally inclined to building businesses. Now, personally, I think that building businesses is the best one, but I'm biased. Um, but it truly does have the potential to create, you know, great, great wealth. Next, let's talk about how these things are different in this new world that we're all in, right? Because this is, you know, tried and true economic theory, but, you know, these things are going to change a lot. They're being, they're changing constantly, not just from things like coronavirus, but also from things like the, how technology is changing the world, how things like social media, or even more so artificial intelligence are going to completely, for lack of a better word, disrupt everything that we think of uh, as true in regards to economic opportunities, right? Now that can be very terrifying, for some, but it can also be exhilarating if you're willing to jump headfirst into change, right? And that will, of course, always involve taking a risk. But isn't the first card of the tarot the fool, you know, somebody jumping off a cliff blissfully unaware, um, you know, into a new reality? This is, you know, ultimately, you can kind of throw out the whole, here's your, here's your tarot lesson for the day, throw out the whole deck, right? Keep the fool card, 
right? Because that's all that life truly is, right? It's constantly jumping into the unknown. The rest, all that, you know, the rest of the 77 cards, yes, those represent, you know, changing circumstances of life, but they're always changing. The only constant is the fool card, right? The, the great unknown leap. What is birth? <laughs> what is death? What is life? But a leap into the unknown, right? So there's your answer in terms of risk or risk aversion. Don't be risk averse because life's, <laughs> life's a risk anyways. But let's talk about where reality is right now. By right now, I mean 2020, but these things are not going to change probably, or rather it's not that they won't change, but that they, they, they will be in a constant uh, and turbulent uh, trajectory of change, a constant flux in the direction that I'm going to point out. So number one, if your current business or your business idea is not online, don't, uh, you, you need to ease back from it. So there's a concept in business and in life called the sunk cost fallacy. And it's the idea that just because you've already put a ton of time and effort into something means that you should continue to do so even if all signals are saying it's a bad idea, right? Now, is this true in businesses? Yes. Is this true of dead end jobs? Absolutely. Can this be true of relationships? Yes. Right? So sometimes reality just forces us to change. And if we, if we don't answer the call to adventure uh, because of the sunk cost fallacy, well, I've already put all this time and effort into this, we may completely miss out, right? So um, it is very unlikely, I will say, that any business that does not at least contain a massive online component or cannot, if needed, completely fulfill operations online, if your business or your job or your business ideas and not include that, it is very unlikely to survive. And even if so, it is, uh, it is, there's a going to be a cap on how far it can scale. And that will be very, very low, right? So the idea of the corner shop, while it is, you know, has in many ways been the lifeblood of America for so long is not going to be a reality anymore. And does that break my heart to say that? Yes, it does. Right. But you know, it is more important for me, uh, for people to thrive than for essentially old games to thrive or old business forms. Increasingly, the world is going in the direction of, of the Amazon.coms of the world it is going in the direction of, um, things like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, even those are obviously being even online businesses that involve a, an interpersonal component are greatly threatened, if not completely dying right? And this is because of COVID, but it is unlikely to go back to the way things were prior to COVID. And if it does, it won't be in quite the same fashion. So I highly recommend that whatever you're doing, it is at least primarily online. Is it ideal? Not necessarily, but it is only online that you can continue to fulfill people's needs without close contact and at scale all over the world. So it's got to be online. When you go online, when you run your business online, your potential customers are the entire world instead of the people that happen to live on your street, right? So this has just been the way of things already since the late 90s. So I'll never forget the first real lesson that I got in how the global economy works. It was in the late 90s when I was working at an independent bookstore in San Diego, California, uh, for many years, actually, in, in fact, before I was legally able to work, uh, you know, I was, I was, I got this job in a bookstore just because I wanted to, to learn to be around books all day long. And, uh, you know, the business was, 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 was well run and all of that. But then one day in 1998, Barnes and Noble moved in across the street, right? And this was the beginning. This was the, uh, you know, when big box store, big box, bookstores really started, were really proliferating all over the U S. So that was Barnes and Noble and borders. And so when the big shiny big box store opened up, they had the, uh, you know, they, they were, they had a cafe, they had couches and chairs and you could sit there reading and they had every book. And, you know, there was no way that, that our little store could compete, you know, cause we were just a little kind of hole in the wall store with a good selection, but there's no coffee there. There was no couches. You just had to come in, buy a book and leave. We couldn't compete. And it was, you know, less than a year that the store had to shut down and it was, it was very sad. Um, but then around the time, a few years later, um, Amazon 
came in and even bigger fish showed up. If you remember, maybe if you're old enough to remember when Amazon just sold books. Wow, I know it wasn't that long ago, but it used to be that Amazon just sold books and then CDs on the internet. And nobody thought that that was going to take off. People will never order things on the internet, they said. Well, lo and behold, people did like ordering things on the internet. And at that point, big box stores like Barnes and Noble, Borders, they started shutting down all over the country. You know, and then I got to see that because at that point I was working in the publishing industry in New York and, uh, you know, and we were sitting there watching the big box stores get taken out at the knees by Jeff Bezos, right? We were the canaries in the coal mine. We were the first people to witness that. And then there was, you know, then there was the Hachette uh, lawsuit. I mean, Amazon really went after small distributors and all of these things. And then they brought in the Kindle to the point where they completely terraformed the entire book industry prior to then going on and doing that for every other industry. But we got it first, right? So that was a fascinating lesson in not just, oh, the big fish eat the little fish. It's more than that, right? This, I think, is the true lesson, which is that if you follow the curve of technology, if you stay out on the far curve of the advance, advancing technology, you will automatically um, be outmoding earlier forms of business, right? So really... It's not as much the company Amazon as much as it is that Amazon happened to be there first in order to capitalize on the inevitable trend of people buying things online. Now, we can now look back and in retrospect, yes, it's obvious that Amazon would happen. It's obvious that somebody would become the Walmart of online. Somebody would figure out how to sell things on the internet, right? And and do it so well that they basically replaced all prior forms of doing business. Now that seems obvious. At the time, it was anything but obvious. People considered it, first they thought it would never take off, and then they considered it a passing fluke. And then the next thing you know, it was, you know, a Tyrannosaurus Rex that, de you know, devoured the world economy, right? But that's just right now, this current period in history. Something else will come along and replace Amazon. It's just the way of things, right? So here's the deal. The entire world economy is now digital and business must take place within the digital space in order to be sustainable. You know, one obvious outcome of the 2020 crisis is the even more extreme digitization and virtualization of basically everything in the world to the point where people are now having birthday parties online, you know, and that's only going to increase. And I think that Yes, you can come up with counterexamples, for instance, the service industry, those parts of the service industry that are still intact. Uh, many of them are not intact. But as a general principle, I think that you can safely bet on creating businesses or looking for economic opportunities that are riding the wave of the digitization and virtualization of everything, right? That's just the way it is. It's the way it is right now. It won't be the way things always will be, but it is uh, more than likely, it is probably inevitable that it is going to be like that for the rest of our lifetime, barring either some true massive collapse or uh, an even you know more advanced technological wave that comes along, right? Which is really an extension of what we're talking about, anyways. And by the way, do you need to be Jeff Bezos to make money on the internet? Do you need to be Mark Zuckerberg? Hell no. You know, you all you need is an idea that maybe 300 people like, uh, but if they're willing to pay you enough for you to live on, then you're good. You don't need a job. You don't need someone to come hire you. By the way, do you need to do everything yourself? No. You know, like you might have a group of friends that wants to work on something. Your family might start a business together. You know, you and your partner might go into business together, right? There's infinite possibilities. And, and also... Uh, your possible labor pool is the entire world at this point. The internet now, not maybe not the internet 10 years ago, but the internet now truly makes anything possible in terms of having an, having an idea and then making it into a reality. As they say, a, or, or as John F. Kennedy once said, a rising tide floats all boats. And that's how the internet works. Yes, are there the standard oils of the internet? You know, uh, are there the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers of the internet? Sure. But 
they have also made these tools that allow literally anybody to become wealthy, let's say running an Etsy shop, right? Or, or even uh, reselling on eBay, things like this. I mean, there are all infinite opportunities on the internet. So this is really a good way to look at things. You have an idea and you manifest it as a reality very quickly with cheap or even free tools, right? So before I mentioned you could throw out the whole tarot deck except for the fool, but hey, let's bring one more card back, right? Which is the magician. Take a look at the classic magician tarot card. There's somebody standing at an altar with their tools manifesting reality. That's you, right? Just put a computer on the table and your ideas, your will, and begin working your will in the world with magical tools infinitely more advanced than a golden dawn wand, right? Who needs a golden dawn wand when you have the cloud, right? Or artificial intelligence, or simply starting out as simple as a web page and a mailing list. You know, at the very basic level, you probably only need, you know, 10, 20 bucks to start a, a month to start a business going, right? It doesn't need to be expensive at all. You need, you don't need startup capital. You don't need investors, right? What you do need is to prove that your idea works right? This is critical, what I'm about to say, because we all have ideas and we all have what we think people want, but none of this is, is valid until you prove that people are willing to pay for what you're selling them, right? And so starting a business is essentially a process of divination. It is a process of trying lots of ideas cheaply on the internet until you find something that sticks, and learning about business as you go. And you may go through 10, 20, 30 iterations, 100 iterations, 200 iterations of ideas until you find the idea, the, the idea that takes you to the moon, right? And there's a very good book that explains how to do this. It is called The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. It's very famous in Silicon Valley. It's very famous in the online business world. And uh, it's essentially a book about testing business ideas. One incredibly famous example of an early business that started on the internet that failed dismally was pets.com. So pets.com was an, uh, the, an idea that a female entrepreneur in the Bay Area came up with where she had the idea that, would make, that you think would make sense, which is selling pet food and supplies online. So her business plan was to essentially outmode Petco and to take Petco online and to do her version of Petco online so that people could buy dog food and collars on the internet. And so she spent, I believe, two years and upwards of $2 million building the perfect website before it was ever released, getting a warehouse where she had all the stuff ready to go, and she figured out how to fulfill orders and all of this before it was ever released. And then finally, Pets.com debuted to great the great fanfare of nobody buying anything because it turned out that people didn't want to buy pet food on the internet or simply that they didn't yet because eventually Amazon came in and <clears throat> you know you can buy pet whatever on Amazon but at the time for whatever reason because people didn't trust the internet because there weren't secure ways to transact on the internet but ultimately because there wasn't any demand for that service pets.com failed miserably and this is a, a very famous story in silicon valley because people learned from that and in fact it was this type of thinking that caused the initial dot com bubble to crash but when the internet came back and then replaced the economy it came back on this this insight this outlook which is that you need to test your idea before you sink money into building it in order to test an idea on the internet, you need to build a free resource first. That can be a blog. Now it can be a podcast. Increasingly, now it can be a YouTube channel, right? But you need to start by growing an audience, by creating free content. And then once you have an audience, you need to test selling something. Because it is not until you have proven that people will pay for your product or your service or whatever it is uh, that you actually have a business. And so... My suggestion to you is if you do want to take the route of business creation is that you take all the ideas that you wrote down in the last unit and you begin testing them. You know, you may have several ideas that crash and burn, but all along you're building your skill set, you're building your uh, understanding of 
how things work. And more importantly, you're gaining an understanding of how to gauge and fulfill the needs of your audience, right? You, what you're learning about is, yes, you're learning about yourself, unless you're, yes, you're learning about systems to do things, but more importantly, you're learning about an audience, right? You're learning about your audience and you're learning what their needs are and how you can best fulfill them. And that's what we talked about earlier, which is that Venn diagram overlap between your passions, your talents, your knowledge, your abilities, and people's true needs. And again, I'm telling you now, you can't second, you can't advance guess that, right? It has to be demonstrated in practice. You can't just come up with that idea and run with it. It has to be shown to you in the process of building and testing ideas. Okay, so look at it this way, all right? Because of technology, we our whole world is filled with almost infinite realities, even more than before. You know, like in this world right now, there are people um, who can't get work as a janitor, right? And I'm telling you that because I've been that person. I've been the person that has applied, it's a true story, I've been the person who has been so broke that I have applied to work as a janitor and been turned down, right? There are also people who are running successful online businesses who don't have to go to an office, who are have turned their passion into something that is an actual working functional business that not only helps people, but it sustains them and sustains other people, is able to, to provide jobs and livelihoods and security for other people, right? And it has able been able to change their lives too, right? And I've been that person too. I'm that person right now, right? <laughs> but then look, there's also like, you know, there's people rioting on the streets uh, because of unfairness and things like this. But there's also at the exact same time, kids making millions of dollars playing video games on Twitch, right? There are literally kids right now making lawyer salaries playing Grand Theft Auto on Twitch and YouTube, right? So the moral of the story is make sure to take notes and get everything you can out of magic.me classes before I throw it all in to go become a professional Fortnite player because that's where the real money is. And if I were just to do a clear, uh, you know, bird's eye economic analysis of the world, I would just be playing uh, video games on Twitch and buying cryptocurrency. So or that could be you, right? There's your idea. <laughs> but that's the world we live in, right? Or rather, that's the worlds we live in. And this is a serious point, right? Not that playing, not that you, I mean, yes, you can play Twitch, on, you know, you can play video games on Twitch for millions of dollars. That's real. That's very serious. But we live in many worlds now. We live in many universes. And, and to even talk about the economy or the, you know, marketplace or the, you know, shape of the world is, is really just lazy speaking at this point. It's like all of this stuff coexists. We do live in a, in a world of chaos in the best sense. And, uh, you know, the alchemy of chaos, if you will, or, you know, the use, the proper use of magic is in reality selection. It really is. It takes just as much effort or more to live in a world of misery and lack of opportunity as it does to live in a world of happiness and opportunity. It's just a question of which one you select. And of course, that selection does not bear fruit overnight. It needs to be persisted in and built over many years. But the payoff is worth it. All right. So your homework is to check out the resources tab. Uh, to sign up for some of these free services if you're interested in building a business. Uh, if that's and that may not be the route you're going to take. And, if, and don't worry, there's lots more routes to wealth that we're about to discuss. But if you're interested in this, check out some of those resources. Maybe sign up for some of those services. And you, again, many of them offer free tiers. And begin testing uh, some of the ideas that you had in the last unit or thinking about maybe outlining a bit how you might go about doing that. And again, definitely read the Lean Startup if you haven't. Okay, let's talk about a different way to play the business game. And that is investing in other people's businesses. That's what we call the stock market, right? Uh, now the stock market is essentially taking part ownership, even if a very small amount in publicly traded businesses. The stock market, uh, and really let's call it the securities market, because we're gonna talk about stocks and bonds, although primarily we're gonna talk about stocks, is, uh, a phenomenal way to continue to generate wealth 
uh, in it that is generated not by your own labor, your own effort, which is finite, but other people's labor, right? And that's essentially investing in the ongoing growth of the economy and putting money to work for you instead of working for money, right? There's a whole science to doing this, but the first thing that I want to point out is that the first thing that most people think about when they think about the stock market is that's complicated and I'm going to lose a lot of money, right? They really get uh, freaked out. The reason that people lose money in the marketplace is because they react with emotion. What's that, you may be asking? Is the secret to investing actually the same thing that we've been talking about this entire course? Non-reactivity? Why, yes. Yes, it is. It absolutely is. The same thing that you've been practicing in meditation, in your relationship of non-avarice, of not clinging, but also not retreating, is exactly how the market works. When everyone is panic buying something, when they're freaking out about the next big thing, Tesla stock, right? Bitcoin in 2017, when they're speculator, they're creating a speculator bubble, that's when you want to sell. And the number one time to buy is in a crisis, right? It is when everyone is in maximum panic, fear, when the sensation that everything is destroyed and will never come back, when that has overridden people's instincts uh, because they're reacting, that's the best time to buy in the darkest periods. And all you need to do to understand this principle is to look at a timeline of the US economy I would say track it by following the Standard & Poor's 500. Look at the value of the Standard & Poor's 500, which tracks the 500 most productive companies on the S&P. It's a good gauge of the US economy overall. And just look at the value over the last 30 years and look at the recession points. So we've got the 2000, 2001.com bubble bursting. We've got the 2008 to 2010 economic crash, which I remember very well, everyone thought was the end of the world. And you look at them on a long time scale and they just look like mm, 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 little dips before the economy skyrocketed past what anyone thought was possible, right? Will it always be like that? Nobody knows, right? But when you take the long view on these things, that's primarily when you can get out of that fight or flight response right? When you can get out of parasympathetic and into sympathetic and ask any trader what the secret is, and they will tell you it is staying calm and not reacting, even when potentially millions of dollars are on the line on a minute by minute trade, right? Uh, it is profound the level of calm that people who trade for a living must develop. And it's also profound how fast their lives are wrecked when they don't do that. So by the way, don't go thinking that just because you've taken this course, you can now go become a master day trader. What I recommend is the same thing that Warren Buffett recommends, which is simply buying and holding index funds long term, right? What is an index fund? An index fund is something that instead of picking and choosing specific stocks, an index fund tracks the whole market. It owns a little bit of every stock on the market, for instance. Or in the case of an ETF, which is a smaller index, which tracks a specific sector, for instance, information technology or materials or something like that, uh, it only it tracks a smaller amount. But what these things do is they are big baskets that contain bits of the whole economy or a whole sector of the economy. And that spreads out the risk, right? If you look at our economy right now in 2020, most of the US economy is floated by only a few companies, what's referred to as the FANG stock. So that's Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, the winners of the technology game. And to, to the extent that they're really now forming the infrastructure for the rest of the companies uh, in, in the world to, to an extent, in the sense that, for instance, companies may be running on a infrastructure of Amazon Web Services, they may be advertising on Facebook and Google, they may be using Apple products to work on and sell on and and so forth, right? So this is really, and I want to underline this, this is another reason why, for instance, in the last unit, I pointed out that it is by surfing the far edge of technology that you get to the good stuff, right? Everything else is either catching up, playing catch up, 
or is essentially floated and now operated by the information economy. And of course, there are ETFs that you can just invest in technology companies if you want to go that route. But the whole idea of an index is to spread out risk and diversify your portfolio so that you own a little bit of everything. So really what you're doing is investing in the economy rather than trying to pick stocks, which I won't say is a fool's errand, but rather it is a full-time job. And unless that is your full-time job, it's probably better to stick with indexes and just buy and hold. Right. The other good thing about indexes is they have very low fees, which over the long period of time will save you tremendous amounts of money. So if you want to learn more about this strategy, I again talk about it a lot in the ADAPT initiative. Uh, you can also check the resources below the video for more books to follow up on on how to do this. But it's it's a profoundly good strategy. It is, you know, the strategy of Warren Buffett. Of course, just to remind you again, I'm not a financial advisor, so I also highly recommend that you get a financial advisor. And if you do, please get a registered investment advisor, a fiduciary who has a legal duty to put your interests before theirs. If you just go get a broker, if you get you know, a hedge fund manager, uh, they're going to be putting their interests before yours and selling you stocks that benefit you, excuse me, that benefit them not you. What you want is a registered investment advisor, and I've given you a link below on where to find one, uh, who, again, has a legal duty to not put their interest before yours. That's the only way to do it. They're a f also known as a fee-based advisor, and so you can spot them easily because they will only give you, they will help you work on your finances simply for a flat fee rather than like a somebody who runs a mutual fund who will take a cut of your gains, right? Stay away from that because they'll, they will take all of your, <laughs> all your money. Uh, don't do that, right? As in addition to recommending bad products, most likely. Now, if you want to get started in investing or even trading, although that is at a more advanced level, there's a couple platforms that I recommend. One is Robinhood, right? Which again, is free to sign up, uh, which is a, where you can essentially trade stocks on your phone. Um, but I recommend these things more for learning the market. You really don't want to jump straight into day trading. Again, it's a full-time job. It's quite easy to lose money at it if you don't know what you're doing. And you may not necessarily make any more money than simply buying and holding things long-term. But Robinhood is an excellent, excellent app to begin learning how the marketplace works. I also recommend checking out TD Ameritrade for a much more, at the more advanced level, where TD Ameritrade, uh, whether you open an account or not, you can also paper trade, which means you can fake trade stocks like a video game, which is an excellent way to learn about the marketplace, will give you an incredible toolkit to uh, look at the entire global economy, to look at the marketplace. And by the way, is this only useful if you want to trade and invest? No. This is also very useful if you want to start a business, right? Because what you will get, they have a platform called Thinkorswim, which is, which is computer software that you can use to trade, but it also gives you access to essentially all of the economic data in the world in real time. And again, it's free. Uh, yes, you can fund an account and trade on it, but you, you can also use it and paper trade or simulation trade for free and get access to real time information, which will allow you and I can't emphasize enough how important this is to completely discard what you see in the financial press, what you see in the news, all of which is hyped up and made to shock or scare or induce greed, just like the rest of the media, which we've talked about. Um, it's it's little, literally smoke and mirrors. When you get access to the actual data of the economy and you can look at how things actually operate, you can throw out everything from pretty much the financial press, right? And just look at how the thing works in real time, right? And I also recommend uh, paper trading at least because it gives you a sense of how the world economy actually works. And by the way, it's a great lesson in non-reactivity. Here's a, an experiment. Just try paper trading on Thinkorswim, you know, for a couple days and you will find out all about fight or flight in real time. Right. And that think about honing these skills to the point where you can master the marketplace. 
now we're talking about real power. And yes, it is the same process, right? And certainly do not actually start day trading without talking to a financial advisor. I'm not responsible for that decision. If you decide to go that route, I don't think it's a very wise decision for most people, unless you want to make that your full-time job. Again, it's mid 2020 and a lot of people are out of work and sitting at home. And a lot of people are day trading now more than ever before. And a lot of people are losing money uh, because they it's easy with day trading to convince yourself you know what you're doing when you really don't, right? And we, we live in a world now where trading is done by AIs and automated, you know, algorithms and things like this. And the idea that an individual day trader can beat the system, which is really what you're trying to do trading, is essentially a fantasy. And for that reason, it's that it's for that reason that I recommend buying, simply buying and holding indexes long term. You won't get killed in trading fees. They are, um, if, particularly if you get them at a place like Vanguard, they have next to non-existent management fees. And they will just continue growing and building dividends uh, long term, right? So highly, highly recommend it. In addition, I recommend maxing out as much as possible into tax free investment vehicles like Roth IRAs, right? These are designed to protect your winnings and your, tr and your investments from being overly taxed. Finally, we mentioned before in the last unit how everything is following the trend of digitization, right? And a big place where that's happening is obviously in the world of finance. And the most exciting trend in that is blockchain, which you probably know of from Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin is a blockchain technology. It is a digital form of currency that uh, essentially, because of the way the algorithm is constructed, allows a sense of scarcity and a sense of security that has completely reinvented money. And the ramifications of blockchain, we are only now beginning to feel. So, you know, I've mentioned in this unit and I mentioned in the in the previous couple of units that dot com 1.0, right? The, the birth of the World Wide Web. And when the World Wide Web first came out, everyone was running around trying to, you know, they says, oh, I just need a web page. Right. And they were throwing all this money at it that wasn't particularly intelligently allocated. And, and it all, you know, it was kind of it was a crazy time. But from that, a couple of key strong players emerged that not just won the online game, they won the entire world economic game. People like Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and, and people like this. Right. That's happening again right now. But instead of the World Wide Web, it is blockchain decentralized financial technology, which is, by the way, not just uh, about finance, but will completely radically change the way that information is shared and information is stored in the entire world. This is happening right now as we speak. And if you are out on the far edge of that curve, there are economic uh, opportunities uh, like you would not believe, right? That literally are unbelievable. Here's the thing. I have com this is such a complex topic at the moment and it requires so much to even explain how these things work and the future and the investment opportunities because there are lots that I've actually created an entire a whole other entire course about this that I call Bitcoin Insider. It is the massive ultimate resource in blockchain or rather Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency, right? Primarily, it's about the promise of the blockchain and how you can spot investment opportunities uh, that would have been unimaginable even 10 years ago, right? Our world is being transformed around us as we speak, and it is still so far out of mainstream consciousness that people are not even aware that it exists, right? They probably heard of Bitcoin, and they may remember when Bitcoin spiked in 2017 and then came back down. Uh, and everyone got greedy and rushed in at exactly the wrong time. But just because there have been ups and downs doesn't mean that the ongoing momentum of the technology itself is still not phenomenal, right? And there are opportunities to make money in the cryptocurrency space uh, where you can double your money, you know, within a few months, where you can 10x your money within a few months. Uh, can you lose all that money that fast as well? Sure. Right. And that's why it requires a disciplined 
and clear approach to it. And again, the advice of a registered investment advisor before investing anything in it. But that said, there's a wild west out there. You know, there's a place called the, the crypto space, the blockchain world. There is a wild west where fortunes are made and lost uh, overnight, literally, where it's like the California gold rush. That's happening right now, too. And so that's why I created this course, Bitcoin Insider, to give you essentially everything you need to know to get into that. So if if the blockchain world is the California gold rush, Bitcoin Insider, my course, is you know, a map to where the gold is and a prospecting pan and a shovel to, you know, dig for dig for gold. It really is. And I'm very proud of it. I stand by it. We're continually updating that course with the newest and best information on the crypto space so that you can keep up to date. And if you're interested in that world, I can't recommend it enough. Now, yes, obviously it's my course, so I'm going to recommend it. But the reason that I created it is because when I got into the blockchain world, I looked around and saw all this hype, right? All these smoke and mirrors, people saying crazy things and a lot of confusion and a lot of well-intentioned people getting into it and maybe not making the most intelligent decisions because they were kind of led astray by people who either didn't have their best interest at heart or simply didn't know, right? I got into this as a journalist, somebody who has no financial stake whatsoever in any crypto product or any any you know coin or or any anything, right? I just do what I always do, which is I go check out some wild and crazy world, learn everything, obsessively learn everything I can about it and then report back from what I found out there, right? That's what I do. I'm a I'm a 21st century shaman, what can I say? I mean, that's what shamans used to do. They used to go out into the woods, talk to the spirits, figure out all the crazy information, process it into a way that makes sense for people, and then bring it back. That's what I've done with magic. I think you can get a sense of that with the whole world of consciousness change and and the occult and all of this stuff. I think you probably can see by now that I can very lucidly communicate on these things. That's what I've done with the cryptocurrency space as well, and will probably continue to do with lots of other topics. So definitely check out Bitcoin Insider if you were interested in crypto. With the caveat, don't put all your money into crypto, please, for the love of God. Take a small amount. Again, talk to a registered investment advisor. Take a small amount that you can comfortably play with to learn about that space with it. Don't, you know, put, you know, don't suddenly decide, oh, I'm going to like put all my money or do what people did back in 2017. I'm going to mortgage my house to buy more Bitcoin during the bubble. Don't be responsible, please. That said, responsibly approached, there absolutely are opportunities to make a lot of money. I mean, that's just how it is, right? It's faster and more dramatically than any other security, um, but with all the more risk, you know. So definitely check out Bitcoin Insider. In addition, I will recommend the following two websites. If you're just getting into cryptocurrency, check out Coinbase, right? Coinbase is the most is the friendliest, most open, most secure, most trusted, um, or one of the most trusted because there's a lot now, uh, as opposed to 10 years ago, the space is very secure, uh, platform for buying some basic cryptos. Uh, you can also check out Gemini, which is a more robust, uh, full featured platform where you can uh, buy uh, more currencies. It was created by the Winklevoss twins, actually famous for having the idea for Facebook that Mark Zuckerberg took. Um, You might've seen them in the movie, The Social Network. Uh, Gemini is a very trusted, excellent platform. And then finally, check out Binance, which is a platform where you can buy and trade almost any cryptocurrency. Uh, And I, I also, um, think that you should probably approach them in that order, you know, Coinbase, uh, Gemini, and then finally Binance, if you go whole hog into this as, as I have at certain points. Start to think about um, investment strategies, start to read some of this information, start to, um, you know, open up some free accounts and learn, you know, watch the charts, you know, look at these things and try to figure them out. You know, it's like, what, what are these, what are candlesticks? Why are things going up and down? Just learn everything, learn everything that you can about it because in learning, and that doesn't necessarily mean put a bunch of money into it. If you want to go that way eventually, then you can, but 
learn because what you're going to learn is how the economy actually works in real time. And that's critical for your success and happiness as a human being flat out, right? Yes, it's critical for making investments, but it's also critical for understanding the business environment and teaching you about business, right? I mean, because, you know, the way that the world works is people come up with businesses. They come up with ideas. They might come up with an idea in their garage, like Steve Jobs and, and, and Wozniak when they came up with the idea for Apple, right? And it was just it was two guys in a garage. Now it's the strongest company in the world, right? So people come up with these businesses. They have an idea, a dream. They build it, they build it, and then they bring it to market. You know, yes, they're, they bring their products to the market, but then once they get built up, they actually bring the business itself to the market and it becomes publicly traded and that creates the world economy. So learn about this system all that you can because this is the true magical system of the world, right? In terms of how things are manifested. It's not the ultimate spiritual truth, truth of anything, right? It is just the marketplace. But remember, you know, even the Tibetans, when they make their map of reality, say that the primary activity of human beings is to operate in the marketplace. And this is how it's done. All right. So that's your homework. Start learning, start checking out some of these free services and start to educate yourself on the world economy, right? Because it's what drives everything. Everything you see around you is created by it. You know, if there's crisis, if there's panic, it's because these little squiggly lines on a screen are, are going down. And if there's happiness and joy and prosperity, it's because these little squiggly lines on the screen are going up. So that's a pretty interesting sigil, don't you think? Time to start learning about it. All right. Let's talk about real estate. So real estate is really its own investment category. It involves buying properties, uh, renting them out, and then selling them. Uh, or you can take the you can take the alternative route of investing in REITs, which are indeed traded on the markets, just like stocks and bonds, and allow you to own parts of real estate and make dividends from that real estate without ever actually touching a house. But if you want to play the real estate game, the 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 real way, the quote unquote, the real way, the hands on way, it basically works like this. You find a place that you want to buy that you think is a good, solid investment opportunity. And then you go to the bank, you get a mortgage and then the you, you, you pay a down payment for the house. And then the bank basically picks up the rest of the house and then you pay a mortgage monthly. Now, that's good for you pay to the bank. Now, that's good for a lot of reasons. Primarily, uh, it doesn't go up, right? It doesn't, you know, rent, if you're renting, renting is always going up. Whereas if you're paying a mortgage, it stays fixed at the rate that you bought the mortgage at. In addition, uh, when you're paying rent, uh, the rent just vanishes and goes to a landlord and it vanishes forever and you never get it back. Whereas with real estate, when you're paying rent, you are paying into a loan of something that you own and then can resell for more money down the line as the property values go up. Or even better, you can get the mortgage on the place, but then rent the place out so that the renters are now paying the mortgage, right? And that's how the real estate the real estate game works. Eventually, you can sell properties, and in America, if you sell a property and then use the proceeds from that to buy a property of equal or higher value, you don't pay any tax on the sale. So what's that? Yes, you have just paid for this place with somebody else's money and then sold it for no tax. And the government loves this because you are essentially helping build the infrastructure of the country. And that is a very stable and tried and tested way to get very wealthy in America and presumably the rest of the world. So here's the thing. How has this changed post COVID? Primarily, America is radically changing because foreign investors, for instance, China, Saudi Arabia, are coming in and buying up a lot of the big cities. For that reason, the property values are not dropping in big cities, even if they are in other places. Uh, we'll see what happens in terms of COVID, but it seems a fair bet that real estate will always go up in value in the long run. The other interesting thing to think about uh, is what we've already talked about, which is the home economy. So in Los Angeles right now, it is expected 
that office spaces will, commercial real estate will collapse, but home real estate will not because people will still be living from home and working from home and paying rent. Another interesting thing to think about is now that all this crazy stuff is happening, people are fleeing the big cities in droves and they're moving to totally new places, right? They're moving out to Colorado or Nevada or, you know, the middle of the country or Montana, all these places that previously were much less inhabited, but are going to be transformed overnight by people fleeing primarily big cities like Los Angeles, New York, Seattle, um, uh, San Francisco, you know, places that are no longer, it's not that they're too expensive, it's that they're too expensive and people can't work there, so they might as well live somewhere else. So think about it like this, right, on the long time scale. When the factory was created, when industrialization happened, you know, in, first in England and then the rest of the world, the world underwent a transformation from agrarian societies to industrial. And what that meant was the primary site of work had been, uh, you know, in the farm, in country, in countryside, in, in rural settings. And people were drawn out of those rural areas into big cities that was necessary because of the technology of the factory and then following that the technology of people congregating in large office buildings in the new economy the post covid economy the virtualized fully virtualized economy things are now going to go decentralized again i think you can bank on that and what that means is the entire landscape not just of america but the whole world will be radically transformed overnight and that means that if you invest potentially in properties in areas that may have been sparsely populated before, but which now have a chance to become, uh, you know, have renaissances to become suddenly populated with lots of people, um, you might stand to do very, very well. This just requires, just like with investing uh, in other in, in securities or crypto, it requires you to think ahead of the curve, to think long term, to think what will the world look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And to do that, you must become a futurist, right? Join the club. You need to think about the future a lot and make hypotheses, right? What will people need? That's Those are the hypotheses that become businesses, but they also become hypotheses on real estate and investments. So this, I hope that you're beginning to look at this as like a crystal ball, right? I mean, it's like if you can look at the world economy and you can just think 10, 20 years ahead as if it was, you know, like you're looking into a crystal ball, you can do very, very well, right? But it requires making informed decisions about way out into the future. And in order to do that, you must be in simple, you know, you must be out of your fight or flight. You must be, you know, relaxed. Right? All the tools that I've given you in this course, in the entire course, will lead you to continuing to grow those skills here, right? They're the foundational things that you need to generate tremendous wealth from the marketplace. So start to think to yourself whether you might be interested in uh, investing in real estate or at the very least investing in an REIT and begin thinking about what the game may look like for you long term. Now, I know what you might be thinking or what you might have thought during some of these units. Something along along the lines of, Jason, this sounds great. I mean, investing in real estate, investing in, you know, in the market, building businesses, that that sounds that all sounds great, but uh maybe I don't have the 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 capital to do that. Maybe I don't have the money, maybe I don't have the time, the resources. I just need to focus on getting food on my plate right now. I totally get that, right? You know, I've given you fairly complex goals to work towards. But again, I don't expect you to have this all figured out right away. Um, what I am hoping is that you begin to think in this direction and work towards, for instance, having enough additional money to invest as a goal um, or to better lay out your investments if you're already there. But if you're like most people, you may be just, you know, just the idea of having surplus cash that doesn't, for instance, go to paying off loans or debts, you know, that sounds like a pipe dream. I totally get it, right? So first off, I want to say that along on every step of the way here, I've recommended free tools, right? So a business, again, you can start with basically no money, maybe, you know, 20 bucks, something like that. Um, 
When it comes to investing, Robinhood is free to sign up on. TD Ameritrade is free uh, if you want to just begin learning. Uh, in terms of real estate, you know, you can, it's, it's free to start learning about this stuff. You know, you don't have to just immediately go out and get a mortgage. Education is free. And, and with finance, education really is the first step, right? And ultimately the last step. I mean, what you want to begin doing is giving yourself a financial education until you begin to know, understand, and master this material enough so that you feel confident investing. Because if you just jump in head first without knowing very much anyways, you, you probably are not going to make the most intelligent decisions unless, again, you go with a registered investment advisor who can guide you, which you probably want to do anyways. But if you're still in the space of, you know, I'm just trying to make ends meet, uh, or I have student loans to pay off, or, you know, or I, I, I need to keep all of my surplus uh, cash because I don't know what the future holds. Um, that's that's fine, right? And uh, the goal here is to master this area of your life, and that means something different for everyone. So if you're just trying to get a hold and control of your day to day finances, great. I have a, a free tool, another free tool that I definitely want to recommend, which is called Mint.com, uh, which is a great online resource for getting a sense of your overall financial picture understanding your assets, your debt, uh, credit card debt, and um, setting some long-term goals. Uh, it's it's free. The way they pay for it is there are ads for certain products that can help you save money, like credit cards with cash back on it and things like that. But you can click those away. You don't need to go for any of their products. Uh, it's fully free to use. I highly, highly recommend that to begin the journey of mastering your finances. And if your first goal is simply to make it from month to month, great. If your goal is to pay off your credit card debt, great. That app, again, is free and can help you do that. And then once you get past those first steps, then you can begin working on uh, uh, long-term investments. But like I said, starting a business is free and can certainly help you pay off that debt, right? But I just wanted to share that tool uh, so that you have a full spectrum of, of basically free tools to use no matter where you are at in your financial journey or your current situation. Okay, so with that said, I want to talk about our last financial quadrant, which is intellectual property. So I've touched upon this a little bit before, but I just want to say that um, ideas can make you a lot of money, right? Now, this can be an idea for, for instance, a artistic work, right? If you're a musician, if you're an artist, if you're a writer, um, you can create, you can, for instance, write a book uh, and those royalties from those books will make you potentially a lot of money into the future. Now, having worked in almost every angle of the publishing business, I can say it is more likely you will be hit by lightning, right? <laughs> you know, the obvious example is J.K. Rowling, who wrote a book you may know of called Harry Potter, uh, who is now wealthier than the queen. But that is a very rare, you know, exception to the rule. But as an aside, however, I do want to say that this is one of these myths that the new economy has busted, however, because, you know, I was grew up hearing, oh, never become a writer because you'll never make any money, right? It's true in some ways, but in others, it's not. So everything that I, so in addition to everything that I just said, if you go on Upwork right now, you can see writers making $100 uh, an hour writing content. Right. So the idea that you couldn't make money as a writer, it just depends on where you're looking and what type of writing you're doing. Right. So a lot of writers, uh, you know, you can make a very good living doing something like that while pursuing your passions, creating a business or, you know, writing the great American novel. And I think that's probably true for almost any uh, artistic or professional endeavor right now. There are almost infinite money ways to make money with your skill set online, right, which could be pursued while building the dream, right? And and it's really true. So, but that's what intellectual property is. And uh, does it have to be the great American novel? No, I mean, for instance, if you're a musician, there are marketplaces online where you can sell little incidental sound effects or music loops, and you can make residuals and royalties off those. And of course, the other option is creating an invention or an idea that uh, you then license out. And I've provided links below on how to start investigating some of these areas 
if this is indeed something that you think you would be good at. If you're already, you know, a talented artist, if you're already a, a talented engineer. Another example, by the way, is software, right? So creating an app. Uh, and you don't need to be a coder to create an app. You can have an idea and then team up with somebody who is a coder. You can hire them at an online marketplace like Upwork or somewhere else, and they can build it for you and then you make the money, right? And either that can be a one-off, you know, you could have a bunch of apps on the app store, or it could be, you know, the basis of a whole business. It could be the next Facebook, right? But what I want to keep underlining here is that Remember, you're learning at a at a at a school called Magic.me, right? And what I've been outlining in all of these units, these economic units, and in the whole class, but specifically in these units, is the actual method by which you can perform alchemy, which is not by turning lead into gold, but by turning an idea into gold, right? One all it takes is one little spark, one little idea that you then act on and manifest into the real world. And your material bases could be, bases could be covered fairly quickly and very quickly in world historical terms. These opportunities have never been possible until now, pretty much the last 10 years, right? So yes, we might be going through tremendous hardship, but we also at the same time have more opportunities than anyone ever has in history, right? For the broad majority of people, we can't discount that. And so Magic is a question of where you put your focus. It is a question of what reality you choose and select. And so in these units, I've given you many methods and places to look where you may select a reality of power, of wealth, of success, of happiness, of prosperity, and of thriving rather than a reality of suffering I'm not saying it's a reality without hardship or that hard work won't be required or that sacrifices won't be required, but a reality that goes in a direction of positive growth and of contribution to the world. So it is my great hope, uh, and you have all of my best wishes, that you in these units have thought about a way, a pathway to power, a way to, to truly revolutionize your life and maybe to make the world a better place for the rest of us. And I, I truly hope this for you. Keep pursuing your own education. Use the internet wisely. Use your time wisely. Begin investigating these avenues of pursuit, business creation, finance, real estate, intellectual property. Keep thinking about it. Work at these things every day. And uh, if you're in an economic crisis, there is nothing better for forcing innovation and business create business creation and wealth creation than economic hardship. I speak from personal experience. The very school that you are watching uh, this unit on right now would not be possible if I had not been put in situations of extreme economic hardship that essentially forced me to create this, right? This is what the, all the samurai know, right? Which is that you must be on death ground. Uh, you must be on do or die ground to truly manifest what you know you must. All right. There is a bright future ahead. Okay. Hope you really, really enjoyed that. As always, you can find out more and see the full course if you're interested at magic.me, which is www.magicmagic.me. And uh, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you're doing podcasts. Spotify. And um, yeah, tell your friends. All right, hang in there. Lots of love. And I will see you on the other side of this accursed year of our Lord 2020. All right, bye.